Today we'll use the four immeasurable thoughts to set our motivation. May all sentient beings possess happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. Hi folks, so today we're going to be talking about the Heart Sutra because I think that you have enough of the pieces of the Heart Sutra that we can now drill into some of the individual aspects and they're going to make some sense. And hopefully you become connected to this very short, very pithy prayer in such a way that it can help facilitate your deeper understanding of reality, of life, of the Dharma, and how to practice in daily life. So uh, the side note is that on the YouTube channel Dalai Lama Archive, His Holiness teaches on the Heart Sutra quite frequently. He taught on it just a few weeks ago, so please always refer to His Holiness whenever you get stuck. The book Essence of the Heart Sutra is an amazing resource by His Holiness as well. There's also a free publication that you can find at Happy Monks Publications on the Heart Sutra to free download the PDF. So anyway, remember that those um, additional resources exist, that they're useful, and this is a continuation of a conversation we've been having, but it's not the end of the story. So here we go. Get your copy of the Heart Sutra out and in front of you if you haven't done so already. I'll start by explaining the title itself from the Study Buddhism website, which is founded by Dr. Alexander Berzin. It's an amazing resource, so just make a mental note of that. There's translations into many languages. Dr. Alexander Berzin's transcript from when he taught this in Riga, Latvia in August of 2009. Dr. Berzin says, This weekend I'm going to be speaking about the Heart Sutra, actually with a longer title. It's the essence of far-reaching discriminating awareness, the vanquishing lady surpassing all. So when we talk about far-reaching discriminating awareness, and this is the word prajna paramita from the Sanskrit, and I mean it's often translated as the perfection of wisdom, but I don't think that really gives a good meaning, a full meaning to the expression. Perfection sounds as though you have to be perfect, and how can I be perfect? So it gives a little bit of a strange meaning. But far-reaching is a much more literal translation of both the Sanskrit and Tibetan, and what we're talking about is discriminating awareness discriminate between reality and what is just impossible. And the clear understanding of that is something which is far-reaching, will take us all the way to, literally, the other shore of samsara. In other words, to liberation and enlightenment. And although we could have this discriminating awareness, this understanding of reality, with varying types of motivation, it becomes far-reaching, becomes a paramita in a sense, when it is together with a bodhicitta motivation. 
And bodhicitta is a mind that is focused on our own individual enlightenments, which have not yet happened, but which can happen on the basis of our Buddha nature factors, the pure nature of the mind and the ability of the mind to understand. And so when we are able to discriminate reality correctly, and we are aimed at reaching enlightenment with this understanding in order to benefit everyone, then it becomes a far-reaching attitude. And here the heart means the essence of it. So the kernel, or the what should we say, all the meaning of the extensive teachings that the Buddha gave about this, all incorporated into a very abbreviated form that synthesizes all the main points. So it's the heart, it's the essence, and it's called a lady or mother in the sense that with this, it will give birth to liberation as, in the various classes, as a Shravika, as a Pratyeka Buddha, or to the enlightenment of a Bodhisattva as a Buddha. And vanquishing lady, surpassing all this, translating the word Bhagavati, the female form of Bhagawan. Bhagawan is usually translated as blessed one in many Western texts. But this is a completely Christian type of term. Blessed by whom? It doesn't mean that at all. So if we look at each of the syllables, vanquishing, this is either someone or something here in the teachings that will vanquish them, get rid of all the obscurations, all of the suffering. And what's implicit here by the word lady is masters who have gained all good qualities by means of this. And surpassing all means that it goes beyond any other type of attainment or a person who has some type of spiritual realization. This is a very essential text. It's quite interesting. Interesting isn't the proper word. It's quite significant than when His Holiness the Dalai Lama teaches these days he usually will begin by having this Heart Sutra recited and recited by all the various traditions. So have it recited by the Chinese and the Vietnamese, and if there are Japanese monks there or Korean monks and Tibetan monks, have it recited in all the different languages. And when anybody teaches, if you do it in the proper traditional way, usually the teacher, if not the teacher plus the audience, recites this in order to overcome any type of ego pride. Oh, I'm so wonderful. I'm up here on the throne in teaching. It's often recommended that if we're going to be doing serious daily meditation, that we will begin it also. I mean, after the motivation and the seven limb prayer to have the Heart Sutra as well. So that again, we don't get into an ego trip of, you know, I'm sitting here meditating, I'm so holy. Now, as far as what type of sutra this is, it is a particular type within what's called the enlightening speech of a Buddha. Some of the sutras are enlightening words that were actually spoken from Buddha's own lips. And within sutras, some are what are called permitted words. And these are the words that describe the audience or starting with, thus have I heard. These are things that are added. Buddha didn't say, thus I have heard, obviously. And when some are what are called enlightening words inspired by the Buddha, in other words, Buddha didn't actually say these himself, but in the presence of the Buddha, someone was inspired in the audience to actually speak. And at the end, the Buddha said, well done. Buddha gave his approval. Okay, so we'll summarize what was discussed so far. From the title, Arya Bhagavati, Chomdendema, Chom is con conqueror. Den possesses something, De gone beyond, literally the conqueror who possesses something great and has gone beyond, sometimes called the Endow Transcendent Destroyer. Adding Ma or Wati is the feminine ending, the woman conqueror, also connotes mother because the perfection of wisdom is likened to the mother who gives birth to the various kinds of Aryas, Hearers, solitary realizers, Mahayana practitioners, Pratyeka Buddhas, Shravakas, and Bodhisattvas, 
all the different types of being who can realize emptiness directly. The perfection of wisdom sutra and the knowledge therein is what gives birth to them. This relates also to Indian culture. The caste of the child is determined by the caste of the father. So then Bhagawan, Bhaga, has the connotation of having overcome obscurations and realized all qualities. One meaning implies destructions, the other implying fortune. So translated into the Tibetan with the sense of both endowed and destroyer. Vatvan is a suffix which denotes possession, also means transcendent. This meaning of the word appears in the word nirvana. Va. Conqueror, because they stop their mental afflictions, the obstacles to omniscience. Okay, so Prajnaparamita. Prajna is knowledge, wisdom. The other side, gone, heart or essence. Because in Indian physiology, this is the place where the consciousnesses that pervade the body gather. So meanings of the perfection of wisdom, three classifications. Scriptural perfection of wisdom, the speech of Lord Buddha belonging to a Mahayana Sutra, which principally teaches any instruction relating to path or result perfection of wisdom. Path perfection of wisdom, the primary wisdom of a bodhisattva, under the influence of the wisdom that realizes emptiness, that is a direct perception of wisdom at the path of seeing. Resultant perfection of wisdom, that resultant ultimate wisdom enhanced by the three qualities, bodhicitta, dedication, and direct perception of emptiness. So perfection of wisdom can either mean that which makes you perfect, that which takes you to the other side, or it can mean the resultant perfection, the other side itself. Called the heart because it's concise, both in words and in subject matter. There are many perfection of wisdom sutras in the Tibetan canon. There are 17 main ones, known as the mothers and sons, and the heart of wisdom that is the shortest, only 25 verses, contains the essence of the teachings. The three main ones that are often referred to as mothers. And this refers to the vast or extensive 100,000 verses, medium 25,000 verses, and brief 8,000 verses. So the Heart Sutra is concise. Back to Dr. Burzen's explanation from the Study Buddhism website. And there are many divisions of such inspired words. And this is the division known as enlightening words inspired by Buddha's concentration. Buddha was in deep absorbed concentration. And inspired by this, then we have Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara getting up and giving this teaching in the form of question and answer. And this teaching is known as a teaching that has the five glorious features. There are glorious, fantastic, also in a colloquial way, I translate it as fantastic, teachers, fantastic teachers, the Buddha, inspired by the Buddha, and a glorious place, Vulture's Peak. And if you've ever been there, this is near Raj Greer. You can actually go there. And it is an elevated hill that has the top of it sort of sticking out like the head of a vulture. And then there's this big valley that you can see from the vulture's peak. So the top of it, you can imagine that there's a throne there and this huge valley filled with all sorts of beings. So it's a very wonderful place. Going there, you can actually visualize what the teachings must have been like. It is very helpful, I find, to actually be at these places so that you can see exactly and imagine that this actually took place. So this is Vulture's Peak at the top, and you can see that the actual space uh, to sit and to teach is not very big. This is in 2018 when my teacher, Kensa Rinpoche Geshitashi Sering, and a lot of his students came to visit for His Holiness's teachings. 
but you can see that the view around is pretty spacious and vast, and there's a large valley around where people could sit and listen. Here's the area where the Buddha was said to have specifically taught. They've built some bricks there to kind of indicate it, and so people aren't walking all over it all the time, I'm guessing. Here are some of the caves underneath it, so people do a lot of practice. So it takes probably 45 minutes to walk up the mountain to Vulture's Peak. There are cows there. And then once you're on top of Vulture's Peak, it's very traditional to, of course, recite the Heart Sutra itself and to really imagine that you're reconnecting with the Buddha when he taught at that time and all of his disciples as well. There's a Buddha statue and a place to place offerings, um, and usually people sit or stand. It's a very common pilgrimage site. And then you walk around or circumambulate the area where the Buddha was said to have taught it. Yes, that's venerable children. So back to Alexander Berzin's explanation. And there's a glorious circle of disciples. So it was all Arya lay people and Arya bodhisattvas and a glorious subject matter, the teachings on voidness. And a glorious time, it was 12 years after Buddha's enlightenment and not very many monastic vows or regulations had been set yet by the Buddha. You know, the vows came about on the basis of difficulties that arose within the monastic community and their relations among each other and their relations with the lay community. And when a problem came up, then Buddha made a certain vow in order to avoid that trouble in future. So because there were very few vows that had been formulated at the time when this teaching was given, then nobody had broken any vows. So all the monks were pure that is the explanation of why it was a glorious time. Okay, so the sutra begins, these words I have heard. It is very interesting, this phrase. Each syllable of it explained with very deep meanings, many different levels of meaning, in the Gyuya Samaja Tantra commentaries to it, because the very first word of it is evam, thus. And a and vam are representing method and wisdom. And there's a tremendous amount of commentary on that. But this is not the occasion to go into that. But you should be aware that this is actually a very significant phrase with which so many of the sutras begin. At one time, the vanquishing master surpassing all. That's Bhagwan, as I explained. That's an epithet of Buddha. And it was also an epithet used for the specific teachings itself in the female form. And as I explained, each of the three syllables has a specific meaning. Bhagawan, or Chamdende in Tibetan. There are so many different epithets of Buddha. Tathagata, Sugata, etc. And each of them have a very full meaning. So it's important to, if we want to understand what the qualities of a Buddha are, to understand the various names with which a Buddha is referred to. So Buddha has vanquished so gotten rid of all the mental obscurations, emotional ones, cognitive ones, and master has gained all, possesses all good qualities. And the Tibetans add surpassing all, the syllable de, simply because Bhagawan can also be used for various Hindu deities, Shiva, Vishnu, etc. So we're still just here at the very beginning, the title and the opening stanzas, it's important to get a good sense of the setup so that the rest of the sutra is gonna make sense and you understand the context. So the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Sridaya Sutra. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagawan was dwelling on Mast Vulture Mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. That's where we are. We haven't gotten any further. So a bit more about this thus did I hear at one time and the great community, etc. 
related to thus did I hear at one time. All sutras start thus did I hear, because Ananda, who was Lord Buddha's attendant for many years, heard all of these directly, then recited them at the first council that convened after Lord Buddha attained Parinirvana. The actual words say something like, this was heard by me, showing that you're getting it straight from someone who was there when the Heart Sutra was taught. Once at one time has several meanings. One, Ananda didn't hear it again, just one. Or two, indicates that the listener, the person who is reciting it for the benefit of others, is of high Dharma intellect, memorized it on the spot. The Bhagawan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain in Rajagriya. Rajagriya, the place of the king where King Bimbisara lived, with a great community of monks and a great assembly of bodhisattvas, there are some disciples, even in the close vicinity of Lord Buddha, when he taught at Walter's Peak, who did not have bodhicitta. These are called monks in this line. But here it is emphasizing that they are the ones who are not bodhisattvas yet. But they are called great, which means they are arhats, ultimate sangha. They've realized emptiness. So we've thoroughly covered the title and the context of the title and its words as well as the first sentence and the second sentence, context and setting. Now we're here. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. At that time is after everyone was seated. The Bhagawan, Chamdin Day, repeated to let you know who was doing the teaching, even though it may not seem like it because everyone else is doing the talking, alerting you to who is actually teaching. Profound, the object upon which Lord Buddha is going to meditation, here it means emptiness. The subject, the meditation called profound perception, or the appearance of the profound, the profound refers to emptiness, and appearance or perception means the appearance in Lord Buddha's mind as Lord Buddha meditates. The categories of phenomena are the five heaps, skandhas, meaning the aggregates, the twelve sources, anatanyas, and the eighteen constituents, datus. So at the beginning, there's this reference to the categories of phenomena in general, which we understand refer to the five aggregates, etc. But then later in the sutra, it goes into more detail. When you're actually yourself meditating, you should be looking at how in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, etc., referring to the aggregates, and then no eye, no ear, no nose, etc., one group, no visual form, no sound, no odor, another group, no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element, another group. So to see the way in which all of these things are empty, or to come to profound perception on them, we look at the dependent arising of all of them, how they all are reliant on each other in order for experience to happen. Then there is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. This is referring to the 12 links of dependent arising that we've spoken about many times, and it's saying how no aspect of any of the 12 links stands alone inherently. So we don't need to go into the 12 links because we've discussed them before, but I think it's interesting to have a look at these 18 constituents and 12 sources and kind of how they're all interdependent and related to one another. So let's just have a look at this chart. What we're talking about here are the constituents and sources. And this particular chart is from the master's program and is from the Vibhashika, the Great Exposition School's perspective, because it's a very clear presentation. So even though it's a lower tenant school, their particular presentation of this is very clear and useful. So if you look at the objects, form, sound, odor, taste, tangible objects, and phenomena, These are included within the form aggregate for the first five, and then the sixth one is included under feeling, discrimination, and compositional factors. And when we look at these, what we're noticing is that all of them are dependent. None of them stand alone. 
they're all related, whether it's to the source or to the form, sound, odor, taste, tangible object, etc. None of them are standing alone, which means they're empty of inherent existence. So then the same is true of the sense powers, the eye constituent, ear constituent, nose constituent, tongue constituent, body constituent, and mental constituent. Mental constituent, of course, goes under consciousness, but the rest are under the aggregative form. And then there's the consciousnesses, which you remember from Lo Rig and Sem Sem Chung, awarenesses and knowers and minds and mental factors. So ear, eye, nose, tongue, body, mental consciousnesses. And these consciousnesses are all dependent upon the aggregate of consciousness. So when we say know this, know that, know this, know that, we mean not standing alone this, or not inherently existent this, or not by itself this. Yeah, nothing on its own, nothing self-created. What you see right now is related on many, many things. What you taste right now related to many, many things and your description of them to yourself, and what you decide to do about them, and whether you decide it's good or bad, and what karmic seeds are watered, etc, etc. So all of these no's mean not by themselves. So the five aggregates, the twelve sources, the eighteen constituents, they're referred to here in this later section, they're also referred to in the very beginning as what the Buddha was absorbed in by this phrase, the categories of phenomena. So now we'll move on to the next section in sequence. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked at the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent existence. Then, through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara. So we'll unpack some of those words and concepts now. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara also means Lord Buddha didn't just go into meditation, he did something else. The Bodhisattva means thinking about Buddhahood to achieve his own goals, is emphasized placing himself in highest enlightenment. He or she will not turn back from Buddhahood. The Mahasattva is to emphasize placing all beings in enlightenment. He's also called a great being, which is the part to fulfill all other beings' goals, thinking about Buddhahood for other beings' sake. Pakpa, meaning Arya, someone who has perceived emptiness directly, a higher being, Chenrezig, in this case, is considered a tenth ground bodhisattva, meaning very close to enlightenment. So Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezig, the Buddha of compassion, was of course already a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, at the time of the Heart Sutra. But there was a tradition of these great beings presenting as lesser than they were, one, because the students might not have the merit to see many fully enlightened beings at once. Also to kind of model this senior student, junior student behavior, or teacher student behavior, guru disciple behavior. So just a little background on why he was a 10th level bodhisattva, as opposed to a fully enlightened Buddha, which he was in reality. The way that this is phrased to indicate this is what's happening is often when Buddhists say, showing the aspect of. To say showing the aspect of means they're presenting one way in order to be accessible or for many other karmic reasons, when in actuality something higher is happening. Usually this phrasing comes about when the discussion is about guru devotion and the guru showing the aspect of doing this or that to teach the disciples. So a bit more about the Compassion Wisdom Buddha's name, using the Sanskrit and the Tibetan. Avalokiteshvara. Avalokita, one who looks down. Ishvara, capable one. Translated into Tibetan as Chenrezig, or Compassion Buddha in English. Chen, 
the honorific for I, re, to look at someone with love, gaze lovingly, zig, to look, means all day and night he is always looking at beings with love. Wanchuk is the Tibetan for Ishvara, Lord of Power, means the proficient one or the accomplished one, which connotes efficiency in speech. Looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom, the practice of the profound mentioned here is an intellectual meditation on emptiness. Here the words are tawa, which refers to the lineage of the profound view, which comes from Manjushri, through Atisha, and Chempa, the lineage of extensive activity, which comes from Maitreya, through Asanga. Usually they are contrasted, but here they are conjoined, to show a union between acting like a bodhisattva and thinking like a bodhisattva. And beheld those five aggregates, also is empty of inherent nature. He is also starting to look at the five parts of a person, going to, going to go into meditation on the five heaps. Each one is a collection, a huge pile of things, so-called skandhas, heaps, aggregates. The first skanda is form, because we are so visual. 95% of our world is visual. And it's quite likely that a direct perception of emptiness will be triggered by an understanding of the visual world. Then, through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra, three kinds of speech of a Buddha, three kinds of scriptures attributed to the Buddha, words actually spoken by the Buddha, speech that has the Buddha's assent or agreement, spoken with the permission of the Buddha, and speech uttered through the Buddha's blessing, inspired by the Buddha. So we've looked at this 10th level Bodhisattva appearance of the great being Arya Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, the Buddha of Compassion. Who is also looking at the profound perfection of wisdom. So with both Chenrezig and the Buddha Shakyamuni there, Shari Prutra asks the question, how should we learn to realize emptiness? If we're going to realize emptiness, what do we do? This profound perfection of wisdom. So then we go on to this part where he said that, and the Bodhisattva, the Mahasattva, or great being, said this, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage. This lineage refers to the lineage or affinity of the Bodhisattva, of the Mahayana. So remember when we talked about the Buddha nature, how there were different disciples and dispositions? Here we're talking about people of the Bodhisattva disposition, also beings of highest intelligence and sharpest faculties, who have a lot of merit and are able to understand this second turning of the wheel immediately without it turning them into either extreme of nihilism or eternalism. So that's what's referred to here by the lineage, or who this is for, the audience that the Buddha, Shariputra, Chenrezig are aiming at. So this conversation amongst the three of them is towards people of this Bodhisattva disposition, and they are being instructed in how to meditate on the perfection of wisdom. And here comes the famous line, form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form, Form is also another, other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. All five aggregates, not just form, but all of them. And so this is, of course, the discussion of ultimate truth and relative truth. This is a discussion of emptiness and dependent arising. And this is going to be gone into a little bit more on Monday, but I'll briefly explain it now. Then we'll go into Shariputra likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Then the section Shariputra, therefore in emptiness there is no form, etc. We already covered when we were talking about the constituents and the sources. So the form is empty, emptiness is form section, we'll start with now.
first line is emphasizing the things you see are empty. They are not coming from their own side. They are devoid of an inherent existence. The second line is emphasizing that forms are a dependent arising, especially that they are created from your concepts. The third and fourth line emphasizes that there's nothing other than that. These lines emphasize the idea that they are really just different versions of the same thing, different manifestations of the same essential material. Form's ultimate nature does not exist as a separate or apart from that particular form. The last line, Form's emptiness itself, lacks inherent existence and does not exist from its own side, from the form it qualifies. Without emptiness, that form could not exist. So now I'll read the way His Eminence Chudin Rinpoche explains it in An Offering Cloud of Nectar, the chapter on the three principal aspects of the path touches on this famous line. The passage in the Heart Sutra, from form is empty, up to, and also there is no form other than emptiness, have the same crucial meaning as the verse in three principal aspects of the path that this commentary is referring to. It states that what is called form appears to us as form, in reliance on many causes and conditions, and therefore is empty of inherent existence. If it were inherently established, it would have to not rely on anything at all. Form appears as form by being established through reliance on causes and conditions, and since it is empty of inherent existence, form is empty. From the book The Logic of Faith by Elizabeth Mattis Namgel, the chapter The Two Truths, Not Two or True. It has never existed as anything whatsoever, yet arises as anything at all. Longchenpa, the basic space of phenomena. By now, you may feel at least somewhat convinced that things don't possess intrinsic characteristics from their own side. You may have even had some direct experiences of looking and not finding, and glimpse the illusory nature of appearance. Yet, like most people, you probably find it challenging to question, say, the many political or ethical principles that you have an emotional or intellectual investment in. Perhaps it feels like a denial to question the assumptions you have around some deeply personal truths for example, those you have developed concerning the circumstances of your own personal history. You may conclude, emptiness is all very well and good, but what about climate change? Don't tell me that doesn't exist. Don't tell me that my sister doesn't have cancer, or that my wife is not having an affair, or that my back doesn't hurt, or that I'm not in love. And especially, don't tell me that Republicans have a better political agenda than Democrats. Any sane and well-adjusted person like me would have to agree that such things are true. When we separate the spiritual from the temporal in this way, we prevent insight from infiltrating delusion. In other words, there is no way to work with the nature of interdependent expression if we reify it or make concrete. This dividing of spiritual insight from the realities of everyday life makes spirituality seem impractical and only suitable for those who are out of touch. Yes, you may argue, meditation and prayer may help me relax and find balance, but aside from that, they have no place for those of us who live in the real world and deal with real problems. Issues such as climate change are not singular, permanent, or independent things, as we have discussed at length. They are instead open-dimensional, dynamic, and subjectively known. Our great challenge as human beings is to learn how to reconcile the nature of things with their expression. A brilliant and renowned 18th century Tibetan Buddhist scholar, J. Mipom Rinpoche, addressed the artificial split between the spiritual and the temporal 
by comparing it to the behavior of an elephant. Elephants roll in the water to wash off the dirt, and then roll in the dirt to dry off. His example humorously dramatizes the expression of a deep misunderstanding, that we have to choose between something being right or wrong, real or unreal, that we have no other option but to affirm or deny experience, and that there is no possibility of reconciling the temporal and the spiritual. This binary model, which we so often adhere to, is described in the Buddhist tradition as the confusion of dualistic thinking. Looking at things through the lens of true and untrue, as we have been discussing throughout this book, is not the most nuanced approach to life. Mipam Rinpoche was deeply influenced by a great master who lived many centuries before him, Nagarjuna. You may call Nagarjuna a spiritual genius because his understanding of interdependence was deeply refined, but his insight didn't simply remain in the realm of his intellect. For him, Patitya Samadapada came alive with the experience of liberation. That means he could see the illusory and magical nature of interdependence, so he experienced unlimited freedom without a trace of misunderstanding. And the way in which he presented the teachings on Pratisha Samatupada rocked the Mahayana Buddhist world. Nagarjuna entered the scene somewhere around the second century and is known as the patriarch of the Madhyamaka, or Middle Way, school. Relative truth, or conventional truth, is a convenient label for anything that expresses itself, that moves or occurs, that can be known, or is knowing itself, and so on. The absolute truth, or ultimate truth, on the other hand is a conventional term for the unfindable nature, or open dimensionality of things. Although the nature of all relative appearance is empty, in that nothing possesses intrinsic characteristics from its own side, there is really no reason to deny experience on a relative practical level. Emptiness does not negate experience. Things are simply empty because they are mutually dependent. To assume that things intrinsically possess objective characteristics is to misunderstand their very nature. To misperceive the nature of appearance is the basis for deception, delusion, and reactivity. If, on the other hand, you remember the open dimensionality of experience, the absolute truth of emptiness, it will inform your actions and you will be able to respond to life based on seeing clearly. There is no essential conflict between the relative and the absolute truth, in the same way that there is no conflict between the appearance of a rainbow and its unfindable nature. Emptiness and appearance seem to oppose each other only when we artificially separate the nature of things from their appearance. They come into conflict only when we think things have to be either real or unreal. When we think that our only option is to affirm or deny them, or decide whether something is or is not. My suggestion is this. Remove the conjunction OR from these equations and frame it differently. An effective way to speak of the relationship between relative and absolute truth would be to use the word BECAUSE instead of OR and to state it this way. It is because everything leans that all things are empty of defining characteristics. In other words, it is because we can't find anything that exists outside the nature of contingent relationship that all things are free or empty of the restricting labels we assign to them. We can also flip this equation around and look at it from the other, unopposing side. We can say, it is because everything is empty, 
or free of defining truths, that the world of infinite expression can arise, unhindered. Can arise, unhindered. Something that was not empty and that possessed its own intrinsic characteristics would by definition lie outside the nature of contingent relationships. Such a thing would be a closed system and couldn't be in relationship with anything. In which case, you would never encounter it. Nothing would move. Everything would be inert. You couldn't experience anything because not being in relationship with anything else, it would not be knowable. Who could speak of such a thing? So I want to emphasize because as the operative word here, in that it aids us in conceptually framing the relationship between nature and appearance. It helps us understand that the relative truth has always been simpatico with emptiness. This was emphatically stated in the single most renowned Buddhist text, the Heart Sutra, when the Buddha, via Avalokiteshvara, revealed to his disciple Shariputra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness is no other than form. What this means is that there is no conflict between the appearance of a thing and its unfindability. In fact, upon looking at things in this way, you cannot say appearance and emptiness are one, but you cannot say they are two either. You cannot say they are the same, and you can't say they are separate. They share a relationship similar to water and ice. You can't separate ice from water. Yet you cannot say they are the same either. When you look into the nature of appearance, you will find that all things are empty of an independent reality. And due to this very absence of true existence, the world of appearances expresses itself through the nature of dependent arising. The entire purpose of the Middle Way investigative tradition is to understand this extraordinary equation. Ironically, what Nagarjuna called the two truths are not actually two, nor are they true, but rather a way of framing experience that allows us to reconcile its two seemingly distinct aspects. The way things appear and function, and their actual mode of being or nature. He refers to them as the two truths to give our dualistic mind something to work with. Yet as you may see, they are not separate, but simply a way of speaking about the aspects of the fullness of experience. In fact, Nagarjuna even made a special point in warning us of the dangers of clinging to either of the truths as true. The relative truth can't be found upon investigation, and the so-called absolute truth is simply not a thing. The absolute truth points to the experience of knowing the nature and appearances of things in an unconfused way. So to cling to the absolute as true would turn the antidote, insight into the empty nature of reality, into a thing or dogma, in which case there could be no seeing through delusion. The mind would have to close down in order to know or reify its object in such a way that it would impede clear seeing. What would be the use of this kind of realization? It would be most useful to see Nagarjuna's teachings on the two truths as a means or tool, rather than a truth, that helps us to use prajna, or accurate discernment, to penetrate misunderstandings we have about the way things are. It is practical by design. It challenges the mind that thinks like an elephant, which is what is needed for insight to occur. The wisdom that comes from seeing the empty nature of things will continue to disrupt the mind that clings to truths, and that's its beauty. 
and so I'd like to summarize from a verse from the Guru Puja or Lama Chipa, one of our most popular pujas that we do twice a month. Verse 108 says, Samsara, cyclic existence, and Nirvana, the state beyond sorrow, lack even an atom of true existence. While cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. We're now going to jump to the section describing the mantra, where it's talking about how the mantra is this and the mantra is that, right towards the end. His Holiness says, in essence of the Heart Sutra, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom. Up to this point, the Heart Sutra is said to be an explanation of emptiness for trainees who are of unexceptional aptitude. The text then makes a concise presentation in the form of a mantra of emptiness, which is aimed at people of highest aptitude. So in general, the second turning of the wheel is for these, quote, sharp faculty students, but even within that spectrum, there are people that catch on quickly or don't catch on quickly due to their merit or their karmic virtue or their mental momentum. The text then reads, Therefore one should know that the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unexcelled mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that quells all suffering is true because it is not deceptive. So unpacking that, the perfection of wisdom itself, prajna paramita, is here referred to as a mantra. The etymological meaning of mantra is to protect the mind. Thus, through attaining the perfection of wisdom, one's mind will be completely protected against erroneous beliefs, against the mental afflictions that arise from such beliefs, and against the suffering produced by the mental afflictions. The perfection of wisdom is called the mantra of great knowledge because thoroughly understanding its meaning eliminates the three poisons of craving, hatred, and delusion. It is called the unexcelled mantra because there is no greater method than the perfection of wisdom for saving one from the extremes of cyclic existence and the isolated peace of individual nirvana. It is called the mantra equal to the unequaled because the Buddha's enlightened state is unequaled. And through the deepest realization of this mantra, one attains a state equal to that state. Finally, the perfection of wisdom is known as the mantra that quells all suffering. Because it quells or squashes or dispels, manifests sufferings, and also removes all the propensities for future suffering. The perfection of wisdom is the ultimate truth, thus the statement, it is true. In the realm of ultimate truth, there is no disparity as there is in conventional reality, between appearance and reality. And thus this manifest, ultimate truth is non-deceptive. This non-deceptiveness also suggests that through actualization of this mantra, the perfection of wisdom can enable one to attain total freedom from suffering and its causes. From this perspective too, we can say, that it is truth. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata gade gade paragate parasam gade bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattvas, the great beings, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom in this way. In Sanskrit, Tathagata literally means, it is thus and prepares the way for what follows. Gate gate means go, go. 
Paragate means go beyond. Parasamgate means go totally beyond. And Bodhisoha can be read as be rooted in the ground of enlightenment. Thus, the entire mantra itself can be translated as go, go, go beyond, go totally beyond, be rooted in the ground of enlightenment. We can interpret this mantra metaphorically to read, go to the other shore, which is to say abandon this shore of samsara, unenlightened existence, which has been our home since beginningless time, and cross to the other shore of final nirvana and complete liberation. The implicit meaning of the Heart Sutra, the mantra contains the implicit or hidden meaning of the Heart Sutra, revealing how the understanding of emptiness is related to the five stages of the path to Buddhahood. We've spoken about this many times, so now we'll shift gears. At this point, there's a meditation instruction that was clarified by a Lama called Geshe Lama Konchok, who was the abbot of Kopan Monastery in Nepal for quite a few years. And he describes a very beautiful way to connect deeply with the practice using this mantra. So if you want to just take a little brief study break in the middle of class and get yourself a meditation posture, we'll just briefly reflect and do this visualization and see how it impacts the rest of the day. Okay, straight back. Clarify, revive your motivation. And now shift to visualization. So the procedure for recitation done by the Kadamba masters is to visualize the Wisdom Mother at the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha. At her heart, Visualize the syllable ah and surrounding this is the Heart Sutra Mantra. While reciting the mantra, infinite light emanates from the mantra. Then imagine oneself and all other sentient beings gaining a realization of emptiness. Tayata gate gate ara gate ara sam gate bodhi soha Tayata Gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi soha chayata gate gate para gate para sam gate just by having the conviction that this prayer contains the entire collection of excellent qualities, you can follow this simple recitation. It is said that if we are able to recite this perfection of Wisdom Sutra, there is a type of substance we can gain that will protect us from being harmed by animals such as snakes, as well as giving protection from spirits and other interferers, they will not come near us. This description is from Teachings from Tibet, from Lama Yeshe Wisdom Archive, by Geshe Lama Konchog, transcribed and edited by Venerable Tupton Konchog. Images are from various sources, including the artist Tashi Maddox and Bhikshuni Tupton Chuki, arranged by Yintin to aid visualization from non-commercial use only. Okay, so I hope that the Heart Sutra is feeling more and more familiar, more and more connected, and that you're starting to have some kind of experience while you read it, some kind of feeling of an old friend to keep you back on track. Um, if you have any questions about it, make a little note and we can talk about it on Monday. Okay, bye.